Okay, we're going to look at the First World War. This is a Ted Racier game put out by Phalanx. I, Phalanx does beautiful components, and <laughs> eh, at least the quality of their counters is beautiful. And, and the quality of the map and everything is all very nice. Um, the imagery of this map is somewhat disturbing. because it kind of it splits three major f um, fronts we're going to call them but honestly each of these numbered regions is actually a front in game terms uh, but you have the western let's call them the theaters you have the western theater the eastern theater and the italian theater just to separate uh, italy from the rest of the western theater um and it's a little weird looking. And this looks very abstract, and it is indeed an abstract game. Remember, Phalanx puts out games that are not really <coughs> uh, intended for normal wargamers. You know, it's more of a, let's re <laughs> normal wargamers. Let's reach out to the, more, the broader gaming public with something uh, that, you know, might be acceptable to them. And you've seen that in some of the Phalanx games that we've seen, although yeah, they do tend to take things, I don't know, I don't know if they're as um, lightweight as that makes it kind of sound. Consider um, Italia, which I have kicking around somewhere, which is basically a Britannia, uh, well, it's a Britannia type game. It's from that family, but it's closer aligned with uh, Hispania, which I have down there. And I've got to get that played sometime, which is really kind of a beast. Um, Italia, not so bad as uh, Hispania is. And I don't know where my Italia is. Maybe it's down in the basement. Because um, I expect it to be down there with like Age of Napoleon and Revolution in this. And I don't see it. Okay. Why did I pick this up? Because it's got kind of a low rating. <laughs> well, someone pointed it out to me as a fairly lightweight World War I game that actually kind of handles national will. Uh, it might have been Gil Collins who, who pointed it out. And there has some interesting aspects to it that I'd like to explore. And when I found a copy within my price desire, uh, I was like, yeah, I'll give this a shot. Let's take a look at some of the major components that you have in the game. First of all, as I mentioned, the board, it's broken up into the theaters. And each theater has fronts in it, which are these numbered regions divided by the red lines, which are uh, composed of cities. Don't worry about the shapes on them. I don't think they matter. And I've got some armies uh, already set up in there. I'm going to be, when I play, I'm going to be using the historical setup. <coughs> Normally, you'd be allowed to devise your own plan. I got my reinforcement. Armies are all set up here, as well as, uh, I don't know what to call them. They're combat counters in the game. They're effectively bonuses that you can add to battles. Um, and they're present in chits, and they represent a number of different things without really, for the most part, being spelled out as to what uh, is involved in them. Um, this is the turn record track. You can see there aren't a lot of turns. There's basically one per year, except 1914. Man, we blow that up. Uh, and uh, remember, there's only a few months in 1914, and it's got two turns in it because there was so much activity at that point. Of course, there was so much activity at the end of the war too, and honestly, the war would not have necessarily ended where it did, it ended because of the collapse of a nation. Uh, so I'm a little iffy about games that have a fixed end date covering any of the world wars, honestly. Um, this is a surrender track as you if you completely win in a front, you may achieve surrender points against the nations that are uh, engaged on that, that own that front. Um, 
and you engage those by succeeding to continue in that victories in that front even though you've already captured everything in it and those surrender points can cause a country to surrender and if a, and this is the national will type thing but very very lightweight um, and as you know uh, you increase the chance of the country just surrendering at the end of the turn due to the losses that it's taken um, that threaten its survival. This is a victory point track. We just keep track of the victory points on here. Those are going to be represented by, I think, the capture of cities. When you capture a city in a front, uh, you get a victory point from it and you take one away from the person who owns the front. <clears throat> uh, let me see, let me see. So you've got base factions in the game, four base factions. It is a four player game that you can play as two or three players. Red is the Franco-British US, I guess. Uh, and it looks like the Italians as well. Black is the Germans. Blue is the Austro-Hungarian. Um, and then green is the Russians, Serbs. There are no Turks. The Turks aren't able to involve themselves here. Uh, the Austro-Hungarians actually have other things like uh, Bulgaria included in them. The Russians and the Easterns have uh, Romania included in them. Whatever. Okay. We have a player aid that I haven't really looked at. It's a list of all the combat shits, the sequence of play, and... Some specific rules, starting on game turn two, each faction must deploy actual armies on certain fronts. Um, I couldn't find any real guidance on the setup other than the historical setup. So I think you're allowed to just freely set up however the hell you like in the base game. I'm not sure about that. Uh, let's go back to this in a little bit. These are matched to every city in the game. And they represent a color of the nation which owns that city. And then uh, they get placed on the board. And, and their front, I think, is probably in the number space. I'm not positive. Um, they get placed on the board as enemies capture them. I'm not sure it's actually the best solution. Um, let's take a look at what we're going to see. So Krakow is green. Well, Krakow is going to be... Uh, Russian controlled. I'm looking for it. Did I hide it somewhere? Oh no, Krakow is... Okay, so that's kind of nice because it shifts the color as you move further onward um, in your area. Okay. Oh. Got a couple more pieces that happen. There's special rules surrounding the Treaty of Brelitovsk. That is a way for the Germans to tell the Russians, there's no Russian Revolution or anything in it that I can see. Maybe it's covered in the chits, but I doubt it. Uh, I doubt that it's fairly significant if it is. Let's see if we have any that are Russian. We have Brusilov. No, I don't see any. Some of these chits, um, most of them are gonna have a color backing. Uh, this is green, that's the allied color. However, some of them have a different color backing, which is a must play. And the first time that you can validly play that shit, you must play it. And those are penalty shits. And for the, act, uh, for the central powers, you have black, I think is the standard, and I think there's blue chits in here. This one should be blue. Um, which are there. And I believe those actually start the, the game in play. Um, then we have these counters, which I don't know what they're for. <laughs> they are not covered here. And unless I see a rule about them, I'm just going to keep scratching my head. Oh, I, you know what they're for? They're f there's two for each. They're for these tracks, which are random, it's an optional rule to randomize the order of play. Okay. And I don't know if I'll play with that or not. <laughs> we 
we'll, we'll see. Um, this is the normal sequence of play, which says the Germans always go first, then the Western Allies, then the Eastern Allies, and then uh, the Austrians, etc. All right. So let's work our way through the rules. Now, I've read these rules before. Um, and like most phalanx rules, they're set up. They're not bad, but they're set up in a kind of a Euro-ish style. A little better than that. They have some numbers and stuff. Uh, as long as the game is simple enough, that works. <laughs> it's not as bad as full-on Euro rules. Okay, I've talked about the pieces. Oh, what I haven't talked about much is the combat units themselves. Um, combat units have three values on them. This is the turn that it enters the game. This is the designation of the unit, which tells you nationality is really probably the only important thing. And then this is the strength points of the unit in combat. And those range, I believe, from one to three. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You have to use their special dice. Unfortunately, these are wooden dice. Wooden dice don't tend to be very uh, well balanced. They're special though, because the fives and sixes have been replaced with S's. So, I mean, you know, you could use normal dice and just try to remember that, but that's a little weird. You have the nationality abbreviations there. If you're playing in three players, you split the two central powers factions, the Austrians and the Germans, which I find a little weird. Uh, and in a four-player game, each faction is its own. In a two-player game, each player, um, well, each player takes a side in the war. Um, you'll notice the armies are placed just in the front. They're not actually in a location. The location is just to indicate what's fallen and what's not. Um, all right. There are going to be six game turns in the game. The first thing you do in a normal game turn, the first game turn, some of this is done. All armies that are currently face up are flipped face down. Then you get reinforcement pieces and any replacements that you're returning to play, and you can deploy them anywhere they're allowed to operate in. And they'll be put face down. And any dummies that have been removed from play, and I think they're removed when exposed, but I don't think I saw a rule on that, um, are also placed face down. So part of what you're doing here is you're deploying your troops at this point and using a fog of war mechanism. <laughs> it's not gonna work too well solo, but we'll, we'll, we'll play it out. You know, I mean, I'm used to dealing with that stuff. There's a minimum garrison rule, which is one reinforcement or replacement has to be on certain fronts on every turn if it's possible. Um, Basically, there has to be an army there. It could have started there already. And for the Western Ally and Germans, it's one through four, everything in the West Front. Uh, Eastern Ally, fronts seven through nine. Most of Russia, although there is a bit of exposure in the uh, South. And for the German Allied fraction, the Austro Hungarians, five, six, nine, and ten which puts us on the Italian front and then over here. Whew. And so we've got a garrison Italy starting on turn two. Uh, deployment is done in order. Um, it looks like it's reversed order of play. Then each player takes alternate uh, rounds, normally in this order. Um, they can do one activation. This can either be to do a combat on a front or to do a, uh, to do a move where you move armies from one front to an adjacent front or fronts, as long as they're able to operate there. Or you can do a strategic transfer where you transfer one or two armies from one front to any other front in which it's allowed to operate, including across theaters. And finally, you can pass if you don't want to do anything at all, which maybe is valid. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Now, you go through four of these rounds, and we'll be marking them off. Hey, the Germans go, the Allies go, the Russians go, the Austrians go, and then we go up here for the second, etc. Once all four have been completed, 
we go down to a victory check. All the armies are flipped over to the front side. Um, if there's armies on a front with no actual uh, opposing armies there, the dummies get removed, I guess, um, you capture a victory city. If this is not possible, all victory cities have already been captured, the faction without an army gets a surrender point, but only if they haven't gotten one earlier in the same turn for the same front. Okay. Um, next, if it's game turn six or any turn that the Alliance controls all the victory cities in six or more fronts, the game ends and victory is determined. If the game does not end, all factions that have at least one surrender point have to roll the die. This can cause the game to end. A faction surrendering, even the Russians, can cause the game to end. Uh, but there's this special option now. The Germans are allowed to offer the Eastern Allies a peace treaty, the Treaty of Brelatovsk, uh, starting with game turn four. And on a two or three player game, where it, there's only one player handling all the allies, the Eastern Allied faction has to accept the treaty if it's offered. In the four-player game, they can choose whether to accept. Um, okay, previously eliminated armies are now returned to the game and placed on the game turn record track for the next game turn at one army per friendly replacement center held. Well, what are replacement centers? I think they're a map key issue and there's no map key. So let's take a look and see if they tell us. Okay. Looks like they're circles. I'm not sure. Any map key information here? So this is a base. A base is... Um, I don't remember the special rules on bases. These are victory cities, and these are replacement cities. I thought victory cities... I thought these all were victory cities, essentially, but I'm beginning to see maybe they distinguish differently. Okay. We'll keep checking. Uh, then you get combat shits thrown into the cup for the next uh, turn. Any that are exposed for that turn. And then you move the surrender markers all back to zero. Uh, what happens, you know, the modifiers you get to the surrender on one turn don't carry over to the next turn. Your will is all good again. Okay. I'm going to pause a little bit here. The normal movement action. Uh, you can move as many armies as you like uh, from a single front. Eh, there's no stacking limitations. Let me make sure I got it right here. A faction may move any and all armies from, uh, yeah, to multiple fronts. That's what I thought. It's not spelled out here properly where I want it. Um, armies which enter a, thr a front through movement must start in an adjacent front of the same theater. It's just shifting your forces. Um, there's some special cases here with German armies under the control of German allied factions. Uh, if they start, in fronts five or six, or nine through eleven, they're under the control of the Austrians. They're allowed to operate there, but they operate at the whim of the Austrians. The Germans can't move their own armies. They can't recall them without the Austrian players' express consent. Uh, British, French, and German armies can only operate uh, in the Italian theater starting on game turn four, which is why there's nothing there. You will notice, though, the Austrians can be there. Uh, the Eastern Allied faction has two armies, the BRMEF and the French Orient armies, that may only operate in front 11 of the, if the Eastern Allied faction controls Monastir. Uh, which is over in front 10. And it starts out under their control. 
Did I get deployment here? Yeah, we'll have to get to that a little bit later. Because there's special rules there. You can see M-E-F-O-R-G-R. -R. Uh, this is what can operate out of that base. Uh, and after you move, you may... Uh, uh, if you do a move, no, if you do a combat. Combat takes place if you pick the combat action. The currently active faction declares a combat on any one front where that faction has actual armies. He's the attacker, the opponent is the defender. The attacker now chooses which armies take part in the combat. They cannot include dummies. Uh, those armies must be turned face up. All attacking armies present do not have to take part. Next, the defender has to reveal all their armies present on that front. All non-dummies must take part in the combat. Revealed armies are removed from the game turn. Uh, revealed dummies are removed. They enter the game next turn. Um, after combat is resolved, however, all the armies present are turned face down. If there are no armies, uh, real armies, uh, belonging to the opposing alliance, the active player can immediately capture a victory city, ending the action. If there's an army or armies of the opposing alliance present, combat's resolved. The defending player puts a combat chit suitable for defense on the table. I believe that's optional. Then the attacking player puts a combat chit suitable for attacking face down. There are four chits that must be used. They're the different colored ones. It's quite fact... Uh, Possible that both factions will not have a combat chit they can use. Eh, it looks like you must choose one. Each faction must choose one army as its lead attacker or defender. The attacker first. The combat value of that army is going to be used in the combat. If there are more attacking, doesn't matter how many more, than defending armies, you add one to the combat value of the lead army. If there's more defending, they add one to their lead army. Uh, each player rolls a die. An S is treated as if it's a zero. The combat value of the lead attacking army is added to the die roll. If the value uh, in the lead defending is added to their die roll, the combat chits are flipped to their front side and their value is added or subtracted from the total. If the attacker has more than the defender, the lead defending army is eliminated. The attacker may capture one victory uh, city on that front. If the defender's total is higher than the attacker's, the lead attacking army is eliminated. If the number's tied, both armies, both lead armies are eliminated. Uh, both alliances have combat chits at the start of the game. They're separated. Uh, only the ones with 1914 are available. Chits are either used when attacking or when defending, um, based on the number the color of the number on the chit. There are also chits with a zero value. They can be used both in attack and defense. They're basically um, using them as dummies or uh, to get them out of your hand, but because you have a limit to how many you can have in your hand. Uh, there's other ways to get them out of your hand, though. Uh, you can only use one combat chit per combat. You can only use a combat chit when the lead army belongs to a country that may use that chit. After using a chit, it goes back in the cup Combat chits enter play whenever an S is rolled in combat. If this happens, the player may take a new combat chit, but he doesn't have to. And you're only allowed to have three at a time. If you're allowed to take a new one, but you have three, you have to put one of the ones you already had back in the cup. If you draw a chit you can't use, uh, you may put it back in the cup at any time. This includes mandatory chits. You may not draw a new chit, however. New combat chits uh, are added to the cup during step five of a game turn. Now, you're playing a particular faction, so. A few of the combat chits must be played. Uh, these include the Pantalons Rouge, Shell Shortage, and uh, Kaiser Tro, and Ludendorff. After playing them, they're going to be permanently removed from the game. Uh, the chits that have to be played have a red or blue backside. The combat results are modified by the chits. Okay. There are these lines between cities, kind of like a point-to-point -point thing. And... Shit, I'm dripping all over onto this stuff. Hold on. Okay. They connect the cities. These are attack lines. 
When you win a battle, you can capture an enemy-controlled victory city, provided it's connected to a city or base you control by an attack line. Uh, and you get the city marker there. Sometimes you have a choice of cities. Uh, however, as long as there is a victory city available to capture, you may not advance to a base to inflict a surrender point. Each time a victory city changes hands, the new owner gains a victory point, while the player losing the city loses a victory point. Use the victory point markers on the game board to indicate the total number of victory points that you have. Uh, bases, unlike cities, do not count for victory points and never change hands. However, if a player wins, now the circles are something special. I don't remember what they were called. They're like replacement point cities or something. Uh, if a player wins a combat and could have advanced on a base, if it could be done, they give it a surrender point, and that marks over on here. Uh, at the end of the game turn, if you have one or more surrender points, you must roll a die. If the die roll is equal to or lower than the number of surrender points, you lose the game. The opposing alliance wins if they're at that point. If there are two players in the winning alliance, they determine victory normally. Rolling an S will not cause a surrender. It's possible that both sides surrender at the same time, have a faction that surrenders, and then the game is lost by everyone. Basically, you're talking about the collapse of enough nations, and you know, just the status quo is just so destroyed. Um, at the end of each game turn, the surrender points go back. Limitations of surrender points per front. You can only get one surrender point per front. Now remember, fronts are not, fronts are each number, right? So like the Russians can be hit four times. The Austrians can be hit, looks like five actually. <laughs> the Western allies, it looks like they can get hit six times, right? So, and the Germans probably have quite a few. Uh, the diaries only go up to four. The dies. Uh, I don't know if that's an actual limit. You have to roll equal to or lower. So yeah, four is all you ever need if you succeed in four. You're guaranteeing if they don't get an S. And, uh, neutral attack lines. Certain attack lines uh, linked to countries that were neutral in the war. The attack line uh, notes the game turn, so like this, is not available till turn three, that uh, you can then use that in either direction, really. Reinforcements and replacements. Not all the armies start the game in play. They show up anew from the game turn record track. Um, and they are allowed to go into the fronts that they're allowed to go in, which should be specified somewhere. The list of front names. I don't have who can go in which front there. So, let's see. During the deployment phase, they're taken and brought into play in any front they're allowed to operate. See the game board. Okay, so I see Units listed here. I do not see units listed in the other fronts on the game board. This bothers me. Front nine lists the abbreviations one, the abbreviations, sorry, A H D E and R U. Does it? Did I cover these? I say it does not. <laughs> but maybe I'm missing something. Um, the fact that those aren't on there, oh, 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 oh here we go. D-E-A-H-R-U, in the bases. And this base has so many different specialized forces, uh, like the MEF and OR, that there's actually a lot of units that can go in there. Okay, so there we go. 
Um, during re reinforcement step, you can place eliminated armies. Uh, you're allowed to bring one in for each replacement center that is friendly. Replaced armies re-enter on the following game turn as if they were reinforcements. The Eastern Allied can place five armies. The other three factions replace four. These numbers may be modified, however. The German faction replacement allowance is modified by one for each of Aachen, Metz, Berlin, and Breslau in enemy control. And I'm assuming these are also victory point cities. We may find something different there. Yeah, Aachen, Metz. Yeah, okay. Uh, you do not get extra replacement points for capturing enemy centers. Uh, through, though controlled by the Eastern Allied faction for all purposes, the IT Balkans, I don't know if that's Italian, I doubt it, uh, BRMEF and French Orient armies count against the Western Allied replacement capacity. In the four-player game to get them replaced, the Eastern Allied player must request the Western Allied player to replace them. Okay. Oh, there it is. ITB. Yeah, it's probably Italian. Uh, winning the game. Players win the game by forcing the other alliances to surrender. Um or by gaining victory points through the control of victory cities. All factions start with six each. Each victory city you capture, you get a victory point, and the other side loses one. Uh, Western Allied, the Western Allied marker moved to seven, yeah. Too many examples confuse me. To determine which alliance wins, you add the victory point totals of both factions and compare it to the total of the two factions of the opposing alliance. The higher total will be the winning faction. Then, um, you look at things based on the type of game beyond that. So in a three-player game, the allied player wins as in the two-player version. But if the allied player loses, the German player wins if he has at least three more victory points than the German allied player. And in the four-player game, I believe you keep that. Uh, first, you determine which alliance wins as if it's two-player. Then the German allied player gets that three-point uh, spread. And if the Allies win, though, the Western Allies have to have one more victory point than the Eastern Allied player. If not, the Eastern Allied player wins, so they win ties. Okay, the special rule is the Treaty of Brelitovsk. During the victory check phase of game turn four or later, the Germans can offer the Eastern Allies uh, a peace treaty. If they accept it, no Russian or Romanian armies may attack or be attacked for the rest of the game. Victory cities cannot change uh, front hands thereafter in fronts 7, 8, and 9, which is most of Russia. <laughs> um, the German allied faction must maintain at least three armies in front 9 for the rest of the game. Uh, in the two or three player game, the allied player must accept the offer because they're playing basically as both sides. In a four-player game, the Eastern Allied player can refuse this, although it can be repeated. If the Allied Alliance wins a four-player game, the Eastern Allied faction receives eight extra victory points for having become communist. It's a weird thing. <laughs> if you can count on the Western Allies to win the game, um or if you're afraid of your own collapse, well, then it may behoove you to uh, sign the treaty. Uh, the following special rules are available. The Schlieffen Plan. The Germans can only attack on uh, fronts one, two, and three at the beginning of the on game turn one. And starting on game turn two and until the end of the game, you randomize the order that factions play. Um, basically, whoever rolls the highest gets to pick which order um, 
they'll deploy their armies, and which order they'll play their game rounds. Followed by the second highest ro roller, etc. Uh, I'm not sure how valuable this is as an option. And then finally, the historical setup. So I'm going to go with the historical setup and the Schlieffen plan. I don't know about that variable plan. I may make a decision in the next 15 minutes or so before I actually start that I'll do that. But that's an overview of the rules. Sorry, I kind of stumbled through them. It's a simple enough game, but the way the wording is structured in the rulebook gave me a little bit of trouble. And it gave me a little bit of trouble when I was, you know, reading the rules gave me a little bit of trouble when I faced them. It's not, you know, that sort of standard SPI format that I'm comfortable with. And everything else seems to cause me trouble <laughs> with almost every game. Uh, all right, well, I'll sum this up and we'll get started soon. By the way, the reason I'm sweating so much, and that's what it is, it's hard to tell. I used to never sweat, but I drink a whole lot of tea and I kind of exerted myself uh, during the pause there. Um, I went on a raid behind my house to see if there was youngies in the trash at the pavilion. There were not. Um, I thought there would be. I thought there'd be cake or something. Or actually little fairy lights because <laughs> somebody had lights up decorating the pavilion. It seems like they took everything away this time. Sometimes, uh, usually, uh, usually they throw a lot of food out and some of it's uh, salvageable. This time, almost nothing. So it may have been a small party or it looked like it was catered and it's just weird. All right, up it goes.